T, Astronomy on Tap, Baton Rouge. Thank you for coming. So tonight we've got two fantastic speakers, one graduate student and one brand new LSU professor. Uh, but first, of course, um, while we're here, we have our, uh, our donation war, which is, which is the better acronym? Is it CHARA, which is, okay, what does this stand for again? The Center for High Angular Resolution Array Astronomy. I got most of the words. Or there's BOAT. You guys may have heard the acronym GOAT. This is the brightest of all time. So which of those do you think is better? Take your vote with your cash. We will have donation jars at the front and coming around during the game time. But for now, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Ashley Elliott, which is a third year graduate student and our, origin or our favorite AOT MC. Uh, she works with Tabby Boyajian on stellar interferometry to do exoplanet science. She got her bachelor's from Embry-Riddle in Arizona, which is impressive. She has two cats named Super and Nova, that is on purpose. Um, and I believe Super's nickname is Soup. Yeah, okay. That's fair. And uh, in her spare time, she likes to bake, travel, and binge shows on Netflix. So ask her about her favorite Netflix shows after her talk, maybe. All right, please put your hands together for Ashley Elliott. All right, hi guys. Uh, it's a little bit different today. Normally I'm doing Brad's job, but today I will actually be giving a talk. So um, today I won't be talking about, um, I'll be touching a little bit on my actual research, but I decided that it would be better to give an overview of what my, re like the facility that I use to do my research and also just the general topic. And especially since we've had a lot of LIGO love recently, gotta talk about other forms of interferometry, so. All right, so before we get started, we need to talk about light. So we all know light, it's what we use to see. I mean, without it, we can't see anything. Um, but the general definition is that it's electromagnetic radiation. So if we go to this lovely uh, little diagram here, we have all forms of light. So we're familiar with our visible spectrum. That gives us our color, that allows us to see. Um, right now, it lets us uh, pretty much see anything. Um, but we have other forms of light. So we have our microwave, our radio, our infrared, our ultraviolet, those harmful sun rays, make sure you're wearing sunscreen, uh, our x-rays, and of course, what turns uh, the Hulk into the Hulk is our gamma rays. So we have all these forms of uh, light here, but for this presentation's purpose, we are only going to focus on the infrared and the visible. So with these two uh, parts of the spectrum, uh, we're able to see a lot. Of course, astronomy deals in pretty much the majority of this spectrum, and you'll hear a little bit about the high energy side from our next speaker later on, um, but we will focus on these. Okay, so. Uh, interferometry, we always have to start with Young's double slit experiment. So before Thomas Young, the general consensus uh, from Isaac Newton, and of course no one wanted to go against Isaac Newton because he was the most famous person. His name, his word was the word in physics. They followed him, no one really went against uh, Newton, but uh, he thought that light was a particle. And so for years, uh, pl uh, plenty theorized that, oh, maybe light isn't just a particle, maybe it's a wave, maybe it's something else, who knows? But no one really went against Isaac Newton. Until the early 1800s, we had Thomas Young. He performed his very famous experiment, um, which is demonstrated here in this diagram. So right here we have uh, plane waves, so just regular old light going through. You send it through two slits. So these two slits right here, one here and one here, they go through, and when they come out of the slit, they turn into curved phase fronts. So instead of flat light, it turns into curved light. And so as it's going through, it's starting to interfere with each other. So you can see uh, these uh, parts here and here, they start to interact. And the light starts to interact in two different ways. It either uh, interferes constructively, meaning it adds together, which leads to those bright spots here in this diagram, or it deconstru uh, deconstructively interferes, which is these uh, dark spots here. And of course, there's a little bit of the in-between where it doesn't completely cancel out and it doesn't completely add together. But in general, when you have uh, light waves and they interact or they uh, interfere, 
they uh, form a pattern. And this pattern generally we call fringes, um, or sometimes when you have a circular aperture instead of just uh, a straight line, you get uh, something called an Aries disk. So you get some cool patterns, basically patterns of light and dark. And of course, this changed everything we knew. Um, this meant that light was actually more like a wave. In reality, we know that light is neither a particle nor a, a wave. It actually exhibits qualities of both. It is both a particle and a wave, um, roughly. It's the general understanding, but it is uh, this experiment is essentially the foundation of quantum mechanics and interferometry. So a very, very famous experiment. Pretty much anybody who's a physics student or has taken a physics lab or is even really interested in physics has probably done this experiment before. I did this several times in undergrad, either in my optics lab or my actual physics lab. It's very famous and it's pretty cool to see. All right, so let's get into interferometry. So at its core, interferometry very simply is the science uh, or the study of interference patterns between two coherent beams of light. Now if you remember from that diagram before, light is not just the light from these light bulbs or the light from the sun. It can be radio waves, it can be microwaves, it can be gamma rays, it can be x-rays, all sorts of stuff. So we take these and it's really weird to think about microwaves being light, um, but or radio waves being light. But we uh, astronomers especially love to use interferometers so we can measure things and we can see things and we can even image some cool stuff. Um, so right here, the most recognized is the Michelson interferometer. So this guy basically invented the modern or the interferometer that we know today. Uh, so simply put, we have this laser or a light source. It's being sent into a beam splitter, and then the light in the beam splitter is split. Hence the name beam splitter. And it's sent to two different mirrors. So we have mirror one and mirror two. And when it hits those mirrors, it's reflected back. It's being sent back into that beam splitter. And it's being sent to this screen here. And so at the screen, that is where we look at these patterns, these fringes, these interference patterns. And that is how we can start measuring things. We can get information. And so this is your very basic interferometer. Um, if you have ever done an optics lab, for anybody who's a physics student, you've probably built one of these before. And of course, we have some very famous interferometers that I'm sure you've heard of. So we have LIGO, Virgo, and CAGRA. LIGO being here in Livingston, Louisiana, um, which I'm sure we're all pretty familiar with here. So the LIGO, uh, LIGO is here in Louisiana and one in Washington. And then we have the Virgo and CAGRA collaborations. I cannot remember off the top of my head where those are but it's a bunch of interferometers across the world. These are done with lasers. So this is more of your visible light. So you have your uh, lasers going through. You have these big long arms here and you have your detector in here. And I'm not gonna talk too much more about that because I'm not an expert in LIGO and do not wanna say the wrong thing. And then of course we have some cool radio wave observatories. So we have ALMA. So ALMA, same concept. It takes, and I'll get a little bit more into how these work. You have your detectors here, and it'll recombine some light. Um, and then we also have the VLA. And astronomers love our acronyms. I'm sure I will be saying a lot of these today. Um, but VLA, very large array, very easy to remember. And this one is what the, this is what the VLA looks like. So this is also a radio wave observatory. Uh, radio wave observatories like to, they're really good for pulsars and a few other things, but they are really, really good for pulsar detection and measuring, so. Okay, so in conclusion, interferometers, astronomers love them. They're very, very useful, especially since we can only do so much with what we have on the ground uh, with single telescopes. All right, so interferometry and astronomy. Uh, so the problem, we have all these lovely observatories. We have Mount Wilson Observatory, uh, there's several uh, single telescopes there. We have them in Hawaii, we have them in Chile, we have them literally all over the world. Now the problem with single telescopes is you can only make them so big before gravity takes over or our wallets start crying. Um, so you can only make them so big uh, and mirrors and lenses are really hard to make really big so we can only do so much. And so the larger the telescope though, 
the greater detail that we can see, which is why we like to have big telescopes. We like to have big telescopes so we can see uh, we can see more, we can see more detail, we can see start really narrowing in those finer details of planets, of stars, of binary systems, of galaxies, of literally anything in our universe. However, like I said, you can only make them so big. So what can solve that um, is our interferometers. And so here is a demonstration of our resolution. And some of it got cut off. These are roughly where some of these should be. Um, don't quote these numbers because I think the slide got a little messed up. But in general, here are a few objects that we should all be familiar with. We have Mercury. We have Betelgeuse. And then we have the lovely uh, short shield radius of Sag, uh, Sagittarius A, which is that really famous black hole picture that came out in 2019. Um, so these numbers here represent an angular uh, size. So what this is, is we look at the sky, and the sky is not flat. It is like a dome, essentially. So we have 360 degrees. And what angular size means is how much of an angle does this one object take up on the sky? So for example, the moon. A full moon takes up roughly half, I'm pretty sure it's like half an arc minute. It's really big. Um, it's, I mean, we see it every day. We can see it with the naked eye. Uh, we don't really need a telescope to see it. I mean, it's, it's there. It's really pretty. We love the moon. The sun is roughly the same size as the moon because it's very big, but it's much farther. So it will appear to be roughly the same size as the moon in our sky. So all of these uh, units here, so we have, this is one arc second, and then we get into milli arc seconds, and then we start getting even smaller. So we really like to see those smaller resolutions because we can see more and we can see more detail. So with these uh, smaller resolutions, we're able to see stuff like the short field radius of this black hole, which was really awesome, groundbreaking science in 2019. Uh, we're able to see the event horizons of black holes. We're able to see a whole lot of exoplanets, which is exactly what I care about because that is my research field. And of course, we can start to look at and monitor some really cool stuff. Um, so with these single telescopes or just regular observatories, we have Hubble Space Telescope. Its resolution, it's good. Chara is better, much better, um, meaning Hubble, uh, Hubble's resolution is about 0 0.1 arc seconds. Pretty sure that's the number. My scale got messed up. Um, Chara, Chara's resolution is 0 0.2 milli arc seconds. That is its best resolution, which means it can see uh, some really fine detail in a lot of different things. Um, so interferometers kind of solve that problem of this better resolution. So the VLTI, which is another interferometer, I do not remember what it stands for, but I'm pretty sure it's something very long something interferometer. Astronomers love their acronyms. And then we have Chara here. And we have our eye limit. So just with the naked eye, roughly, this is about where our eyes can see. Our ground-based seeing limit, which accounts for the atmosphere, a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, but these interferometers, they're sitting way over here. And even they're not good enough. Um, a lot of these are taken with uh, observatories that are sent out into space. Uh, James Webb is, is producing all of those very lovely images, but that is because it is very far away from us and it is a very powerful um, telescope. So it is a regular optical telescope. Well, I say optical, but it is not an inter interferometer, um, but because it is so far away, it's able to see things in much greater detail and it's very big too, so that helps. But of course, we can only make ground-based stuff uh, so big. So we go into interferometry. So a, a stellar or optical interferometer, it's very different than your radio wave observatories or your or LIGO. So LIGO uses that big laser. LIGO measures the gravitational uh, wave influxes when they come through. And I, in fact, it just recently turned back on and I think it, w it detected something as they were trying to calibrate it. So what are the chances of that happening? But it was pretty cool. Uh, so with stellar interferometry, um, instead of using, in that Mickelson uh, interferometer, instead of using two mirrors and a beam splitter, what it does is that it uses two telescopes. Or plot twist, you'll find out soon, you can use more than two telescopes. But it's basic. You have two telescopes. You have telescope one, telescope two, and it is going to observe the same star or the same object. 
So that object is going to send light. It's going to see that light. And with telescope one, it, the light is going to reach that telescope first. It is closer to that, it's closer to that object, so it's gonna hit that uh, first. And because it's going to hit this light first, and the light is gonna hit the second telescope a little bit after, we have to account for that. So we want uh, at our detector to, or at the detector to have the light kind of reach uh, the, at the same point at the same time. So we have to send light from this first telescope into this optical path length compensation, or we call it OPAL. Uh, so in this little building here, which I'll show you at Chara, uh, there's beam lines. So it's sent, it's, the light is sent, it is accounted for uh, roughly just how much longer it's gonna take the light to hit that second telescope. And of course we have, um, because we have two telescopes, and these two telescopes, they're very, they're not very big. They could be pretty small, they could be a little bit bigger, who knows. What we can control with two separate telescopes though, and this is what makes interferometry much better with res, uh, at getting better resolution, is we can control this baseline. So the resolution of a single ground-based telescope, its, its resolution is reliant off of the size of its mirror, so the diameter of its mirror. And so with an interferometer, that diameter is this baseline. So because we have two individual telescopes, we can move those telescopes and we can place them at certain, uh, certain points. We can adjust that baseline to fit our needs. And we can see something in finer detail. If we need something that's maybe a little bit bigger and we don't need to see smaller details, we can adjust that baseline, so on and so forth. So instead of controlling the size of the mirror or the size of the lens, we just control the distance between the two telescopes. And that's what makes interferometers really powerful uh, in astronomy is because we don't have, it's a lot cheaper to move it, either move a telescope, which is actually in the process of doing, uh, of putting telescopes on tracks. Um, it's a lot cheaper to just build a few small telescopes than build a really big telescope. So to just demonstrate how powerful this can be, um, actually, the slide, uh, I will actually go here first. Um, so this is CHARA. Uh, this CHARA stands for the Center for High Angular Resolution Astronomy. So Brad got it right. Good job. <laughs> Proud of you. Uh, so what CHARA is, it's located on Mount Wilson, California, uh, which is just on the outskirts of LA. And actually, if you ever visit the observatory, you can see the marine layer that covers LA. So you really can't see LA when you're on top of the mountain. And it's kind of weird, because when I first heard about it, I'm like, really, you're gonna put a telescope in Los Angeles, California, with all those lights? That doesn't make a lot of sense. But the marine layer, the smog, the clouds, covers that up, and we're good to go. Uh, so, we have, this is the entire facility here. Um, so this right here is the 100-inch telescope. It is a huge building. It is a very large telescope, because it has to uh, account for the weight of that 100-inch mirror, um, which is also part of the problem of just single telescopes. But we have six telescopes. We have two here, two here, and two here. Uh, they're in this arrangement, they're a little Y-shaped uh, arrangement. And this L-shaped building here is where we have the beam combining lab and the delay lines. So the delay lines themselves are in this long part of the L and the short part of the L is where all of our instruments are. So this is where all the light gets recombined, this is where the measurements are taken, uh, this is where all the fun optics are. Um, and also the beam lines are really cool, I got to go see it. Um, it's a lot of optics equipment and it's crazy in there. Uh, so, uh, the largest baseline at Chara is 330 meters, and for reference, uh, that would be around the same size of a single telescope, uh, the size of a mountain. So you take two telescopes, just put them 330 meters apart. It has the resolution capability of like roughly a mirror the size of a small mountain. So that is exactly how powerful interferometers can be and how amazing these uh, instruments are. So its best resolution is 0.2 milliarc seconds in the optical and 0.5 milliarc seconds in the near infrared. And these numbers are getting improved every day. Um, they're building more instruments, commissioning more stuff, more ways, coming up with weird, fun ways to reduce noise and get that resolution even finer. Uh, so with Chara, we're able to do a whole bunch. Um, so before I get into that, I'm actually gonna go back. 
Okay, so I talked about the in a from shoe when the beams combine, they produce something that looks like this. So these are called, this is your fringe pattern. Um, we call them fringes for short, because it's just easier. Uh, so what you actually measure, so you have this light, it's coming down, it's being sent down these delay lines, it's being sent through mirrors, yada, 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 into instruments. What are we actually measuring? So you get this pattern, cool, what next, right? All right, so we care about something called visibilities. So the visibilities themselves are the maximum and the minimum of these fringe packets. So you get these visibilities. This is gonna tell you roughly it's the intensity of the light. That's the general without showing you long complicated equations that even I really don't understand very well. Um, you get these maximum and minimums, you get these visibilities. And from these visibilities, we can determine how resolved a star is. So whether it looks like a point source, whether it looks like a fuzzy dot on the sky. Um, and so if we get an unresolved source, uh, it's gonna have an amplitude of one, meaning there's pretty much uh, no difference between the maximum and minimum, it's just, you're good to go. Or if, uh, and then the more resolved it is, it's gonna have a decrease in the visibilities. So this visibility allows for measurements of size, of shape, and Recently, surface features. So using an interferometer to actually image the surface of stars is really cool, and I'll show you some really cool images uh, later on in the presentation. Okay, so introduce Chara, and these are all the cool instruments. So this looks like a hot mess, I'm aware. But this is uh, one of the instruments. This is called Classic, so Classic is in the, I'm pretty sure it's the it's the green here, and CLIMB is the red. So like I said, astronomers love their acronyms. I don't know what this stands for because I could not find it in a, enough time, but we call it CLASSIC, we call it CLIMB, and it's always capitalized. So CLASSIC itself is an open air aperture plane, broadband single spectral channel instrument. So a lot of big words basically to say it focuses on one wavelength of light and it's in open air. So it's not in a vacuum, it's not like covered, it's, this, is, this is just the instrument. So that this lab here, this instrument is sitting on a table in that small part of the L. All of these instruments sit on uh, an optics table in that part of the L. Uh, so the light is sent, it's sent into this little instrument here and visibilities are taken, yada, yada, yada. My advisor used Classic a lot uh, when she worked with Chara, and she still does, but we've kind of moved on to different instruments. Uh, so Classic itself is the actual first uh, two-beam combiner at Chara, and it still has the faintest magnitude limit of all the instruments. Uh, so once again, we're also limited not just by size, but the magnitude of the star, so how bright the star is. So Classic is really useful for those really faint objects that we can't see, um, and Climb itself is a addition to Classic. So Classic and Climb are essentially the same thing. Climb just is the three beam addition. So you can do interferometry, not just with two, but with three. And you'll find out shortly that you can also do it with all six telescopes. And in fact, with the BLTI and a few others that are coming, uh, other interferometers that are in the works, you can do it with even more. And we really like that because the more light, the more detail we can see. All right, and so both Classic and Climb operate in the near infrared. All right, PAVO. This is the instrument that I use for my research currently. Uh, once again, this looks like a hot mess, as most of the instruments do. The Merck X instrument, which I'll show you next, is actually really arranged very neatly, and I like it because it's actually neat and organized instead of a hot mess. <laughs> um, but PAVO itself, it can take two to three uh, beams and combine them. And with PAVO is unique because it takes, it spectrally uh, disperses light over this bandwidth here. So 630 to 950 nanometers. Uh, it disperses it into about 15 different sections. So it takes it and equally disperses it. And then it recombines everything. And PAVO can achieve a resolution of around 0.2 milli arc seconds. Now this number is with perfect conditions, meaning the sky was very clear, there was no humidity, the weather was great, the instrument wasn't being um, hard-headed because it does not like us a lot. Um, for example, I went on a 10-night observing run, used this instrument, and in 10 nights I got an hour of usable data in 10 nights. 
So Pavo, Pavo can be very difficult. Um, but it does have a great resolution. Um, it is one of the optical instruments, uh, and most of these work in the near infrared, so the optical can, is still very useful. Okay, so Merck X, and Mystic, uh, Merck X and Mystic. These are commissioned by University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, um, and it does a lot. See, I told you, this is much more organized than all of the other ones. It still kind of looks like a hot mess, but at least that one looks a little bit more organized. So Merck X and Mystic, they both use all, they can use up to six uh, beams. Sometimes they use four, but most of the time they're using all six. And because they can use all six, they can do some really, really cool science with it. So Merck X and Mystic are the ones that are normally producing the images that I'm gonna show you shortly. So Pavo can't really do imaging. Uh, Pavo just uses two to three. That is the one that we use mainly for measuring uh, stellar diameters or stellar radii and a few other things, but Merck X and Mystic, they're the ones doing all the imaging. So Merck X operates in the near infrared, and it uses optical fibers to disperse the light. So instead of dispersing the light like Pavo, with his, which is a little teeny tiny prism, it's nothing else more than just a few prisms. Um, it's really tiny. I, when I went and toured the lab, it was like, I was like, I don't know how you didn't lose this little tiny thing. It was like smaller than a dime. Um, but they use optical fibers, and Mystic itself, um, it is a K-band, so it, instead of operating in J and H, it does K, and this one stands for the Michigan Young Star Imager. Um, once again, astronomers, we really love our acronyms, and we will do a lot to fit a good word. And coming online, we don't know when yet, is an instrument called Spica. Now, Spica is going to be, um, it's gonna use all six beams, but is going to operate in the optical, so the visible, instead of the near infrared. So we don't have more than a three beam combiner in the optical, we just have a two, three uh, with Pavo, um, but it's supposed to be able to op uh, use all six, and it's gonna be equipped with a low res spectrograph, and it aims to measure uh, the stellar diameters of over a thousand stars in the main sequence. Now once again, a thousand sounds like a really large number, but we're talking astronomy here. There's millions and billions and trillions of stars out there. But the more we know, the more we can measure, the more we can start to learn more about our universe. But a thousand stars, really impressive there. This is not online, we do not know when it's coming online yet, but hopefully soon. Okay, so I've talked about the instruments, talked about the facility. All right, let me make sure I didn't skip, okay. So now what is the science that Chara can do? Well, it can do quite a lot. Uh, so for uh, the first thing, and this is what I do currently, is it measures stellar diameters. So you can use those visibilities that I talked about with those fringes, and you can produce a plot that looks like this. So what this plot shows is a visibility versus baseline, so the baseline being the distance between those two telescopes, and the visibility being those differences between the maximum and minimum of your fringes. It, you can produce these curves, and using, once again, an equation that I will not show you, but it's very complicated, uses a bunch of vessel functions, um, you can fit uh, and get the angular diameter out. So what this curve kind of shows you is the difference between um, a smaller star and a larger star. So with your smaller star, you have a very wide visibility curve. You don't see it really hit zero at all. Um, and for stellar diameters, we don't really care about what happens in these two little bumps here. But for other types of science, we, we, we start to care. Um, I don't personally care just yet because that's not what I'm doing, but in the future, maybe in my thesis I will. So larger star means smaller uh, visibility amplitude. So this first lobe here gives you information about the size and the shape of the star. So this is where you get those angular diameters. And from those angular diameters, you can get a lot of cool stuff. You can get the effect of temperature. You can use some other science to do the bolometric flux. You can get the linear radius. You can get the luminosity. So basically, you can get a lot of information about your star from this one plot, or basically from your angular diameter. And then it just expands from there. So for example, there we go. Uh, this plot here is uh, compiled by uh, Von Braun and Boyajian, so Boyajian being my advisor here. Uh, this plot is a roughly 300 stars that have been measured with stellar interferometry. 
This is uh, this was a plot done in 2017, so there's been even more considering it's 2023 now. Uh, about 60 of these stars are exoplanet host stars, so this is why I care about this. Um, but a bunch of these were measured with Chara. So we can see a very lovely HR diagram happening uh, with, this, uh, with this plot. So we've measured quite a lot of stars, and we're measuring even more um, and continuing to measure more because, well, we can and might as well. And also because a lot of these are exoplanet host stars. And so there's a very famous saying, especially at Chara, uh, it's know thy, uh, know thy star, know thy planet, which essentially means once you know everything you want to know about the star, so your temperature, your bolometric flux, your luminosity, your size, your, um, uh, your mass, your age, you can start to really narrow down those parameters of your planet. Uh, because, well, your star will affect your planet. So if you, need, if you know the star, you're going to know a little bit more about your planet. So this is why we care about diameters. OK, nova explosions. Chara was really lucky um, to actually image a nova explosion in 2013. Yes. Uh, so what happened was um, Nova Delphinus 2013 was discovered by Japanese amateur astronomer Koichi Itagaki. Uh, and didn't think it was a nova explosion, and then started realizing something else was kind of off about it. And so Chara decided, might as well, let's go look at it. So over the course of about two months, uh, it used Merck, so that not Merck X, Merck. So Merck is the same as Merck X. Merck X is just a little bit of uh, some additions. Uh, they observed it with Merck, and they were actually able to image the explosion. So this plot here shows uh, three days, five days, and seven days. So the fact that we were able to image an actual nova explosion with an interferometer is really cool, in my opinion. I mean, getting to actually see this explosion, um, of course, it's not like a fantastic detail like your James Webb pictures or anything like that, but you can still see the fact that it is getting bigger and bigger, and you can see this gas and the dust and everything like slowly start to disperse. Um, so the fact that we were able to image this and look at this and actually see a nova explosion with an interferometer was absolutely incredible. We also can look at rapid rotators. So rapid rotators are stars that are spinning really fast. So they are spinning so fast that they, instead of becoming or staying spherical, which we like to think most stars are, um, it actually becomes more egg-shaped or more oblong. So what Chara can do, and most of this is done with Mark X and Mystic, uh, you're able to image the shape of these stars. So these are actual images of Regulus. I'm not even going to try and pronounce that. Altair, Alder, uh, Alderaman, and Beta Cass. Uh, these are actual surface images of these stars with a grid kind of overlying these. Um, so this also shows the effect of gravity darkening. So you can see these lighter spots and these darker spots. And all of this is real-time footage of these stars. So of course, it goes through a lot of data processing and image stuff. But this is direct from the star. It's not computer. It's not an animation or anything like that. Like This is actual data taken of these stars. So getting to see and start to measure the shape and the gravity darkening or being able to see all this with the interferometer, this is some more of the groundbreaking science that Chara can do. OK, spotted magnetic stars. So we also can measure sunspots or star spots uh, when they're not on our sun. So sunspots or star spots are little areas of the sun that are effectively cooler than the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the surface. So the spots appear darker on the surface, uh, which is shown here in this plot here. So this little dark spot here, dark spot here, some here. These are cooler parts of the star. So they're little, the sun has a lovely cycle. You can check it every day. You can see, oh, how many spots does the sun have on it? Uh, sun has on it currently. And, you know, in Astronomy 101, we always checked it every class. Um, it was just kind of a habit at that point. Um, but with Chara, we can actually uh, image these, uh, the surfaces. Now, this uh, star here, um, this is the time lapse of Zeta Andromeda. Uh, and it has a unique star spot pattern. So most star spots happen on the equator of stars. Um, they don't really vary from there. 
But in this case, there's a lovely cluster of them at the poles. Uh, now, I'm not going to try and explain why this is happening, because I don't know much about magnetic fields in stars. Um, that will be more of uh, Eric. <laughs> He'll probably, no? Ah, I lied. Most of yeah. Maybe another astronomer in the audience can try and answer some questions. <laughs> but uh, we can see these uh, this unique pattern and start to understand them a little bit more. The more we see, the more unique spots we can have. If we can see other stars that have this kind of pattern, maybe we can start to put two and two together and figure out why this is happening. But the fact that we can see this on a star that is not very close to us, it is very far away, is, once again, I used to say this a lot, pretty incredible. And we can also look at binaries. So we have, uh, this is, this, uh, I'm pretty sure it was not data taken at Chara. This is just a cool um, little GIF. It can image binaries. It's just very difficult with binary systems, uh, especially since the binary systems that Chara can look at are only ones that are kind of close together. They're short periods. And most of the time when they're short periods, they kind of run a little fast. But Chara can image them. They can look at the companions. They can figure out how far apart they are. And they can also track the orbits. So. Quite a lot of science there. And lastly, they can look at BE stars. So BE stars are rapidly rotating massive stars that eject gas into a disk. So we like disks in astronomy because most of the time disks around stars means it could be a protoplanetary disk, meaning that's where planets are formed. And as someone that likes exoplanets, we are really, we really like these. Um, so the fact that we can look at these disks, we can start to study these disks, and in fact, um, Ibrahim et al. in 2023, they used Merck X and Mystic to observe the BE star, the Herbig BE star HD 190073, which is this one right here, and this is the disk here, and there's this cool little feature in the disk. So not only are we able to see surface features of stars, we can see features on disks around stars, which is also insane. The fact that we can actually pinpoint that there is some weird little feature here. So these are taken um, epoch A and epoch B. This is data taken at different times. So we have this little, this little feature moving. And I will not try and talk about this more because this is not my research and I don't want to say the wrong thing. But you're able to see these disks. You're able to see the features in these disks. And from there, a ton of other science can start to happen. Come on. All right. Oh, no. There we go. We're going to play tag here. There we go. OK. So in conclusion, interferometers, we love them in astronomy. They're very, very powerful instruments. Um, and they answer the need for high resolution um, capabilities. So. Char itself is one of the most, uh, it's considered one of the most powerful inter optical or stellar interferometers. Um, of course, there are plenty being developed and built and funded and everything like that. Once we showed that Chara works this well, it, they're exploding all over the world now. So better interferometers, VLTI is one of them. They're coming online. I think they're starting to include, I want to say 12 beams. That number might be wrong. And I think another interferometer is trying to put telescopes on tracks, meaning we're not just going to put two telescopes and build them in these exact spots. They're actually trying to put them on tracks so they can be adjusted. Um, so they're going to be put in a spot, but they can still move. And so that's hopefully also going to work out pretty well. We can do some even cooler science. But Char itself, really awesome. I'm super excited to work with it. Um, and as you see, there's a ton of science that can be done with just an interferometer. And with that, I'll take any questions. All right, what a wonderful talk. Uh, we'll give it a minute for the YouTube people to uh, catch up from that internet delay. But for now, uh, I'll take the first question, and I'll just ask, you were on Chara for 10 days. That's a long time to be on a mountain. Um, but what was your favorite part about being on the mountain? I know the sky is really nice up there. What was your favorite part? Oh, wow. Um, well, the views itself, absolutely incredible. I should have put pictures up there. Um,
But I think just getting to actually work or be at a telescope at the cinephrometer and getting to see the optics, the delay line, um, and the actual instruments was really cool. Getting to see where the science is actually being done is always a unique experience instead of just hearing about it or using the data. The fact that I actually got to see and take the data, I think was also really fun. Also, there's someone on the mountain that has a dog named Stella and she is an absolute beautiful dog and she's so friendly and we played fetch for like an hour. Also, there's a, a mountain cat with one eye. He's really cool, um, but yeah. Terrifying. <laughs> Open up to the audience for questions. To clarify, not like a mountain lion. It's like an actual like feral like house cat, not like a big cat. It's just like a small, like normal pet cat, yeah. Yeah, so let me quickly, can we, Colin, can you, or nope, I got it, we're good, I found the, there we go. Okay, so the question was um, trying to connect the dots between how, like, how the lights actually combined and like where it's actually happening, right? Is that the question? Okay, so the science, so you have these telescopes, so for example, most of the time uh, when you're picking your telescopes, you're not gonna do this telescope and this telescope or this one and this one, you're gonna choose one here one here, this one, and this one, um, because those are very short baselines, so we can't really see a lot. So the light is going to hit this telescope, let's say we're doing this one and this one. Light is gonna hit this telescope, uh, it's gonna hit this one first, and the light is gonna be sent in here, it's gonna be sent into this long little uh, part of the building here, and it's gonna be sent down these delay lines, it's gonna, basically just gonna be bounced in some mirrors until the light from this telescope reaches the facility here. And so once it hits here, the light um, from this telescope is also gonna be recombined in this short part of the L. And that's where all the instruments are. So the light is recombined in the instruments. And that's where all the data is taken. So it's recombined, sent through those instruments, and that's where the data is taken. Keila. What's your favorite Pokemon? <laughs> so our traditional question of AOT is what is my favorite Pokemon? Um, that's a hard one. I really like Arcanine. That one's always been a favorite of mine. That one and Ninetales, I can't really, I can't really pick between the two. Any other questions? Good online. Cool. Okay. All right, I've got another question. Um, kind of one I already know the answer to, but I think it's still really impressive. So Chara has a lot of mirrors and um, beam splitters. And so by the time you actually receive your light at the sensor, you have a very small amount of it left. Do you know how many reflections are in your instrument and how much of that original light you actually have left? The amount of original light, I don't remember the number off the top of my head. I know it's definitely much less. Um, so for these are all vacuum uh, vacuum tubes. So the light being sent on those vacuum tubes is pre uh, preserved as much as possible. But of course, when it's being sent into the uh, beam combining lab and the delay lines, of course, you're going to lose some. Um, reflections with Pavo, I don't... It, the reflections are based on, especially with the delay line, is dependent on which telescopes you're using and uh, which uh, pair you have. So if you have a shorter baseline, you're gonna need a little bit less of reflections going on to account for that delay. You're larger, you're gonna have to account for that a little bit more because the larger your baseline, the larger your delay type thing. Uh, I do not remember the numbers off the top of my head though, but I know that uh, a good portion is lost um, when it actually finally hits the instrument. But that's also why that facility is kept very dark and very sealed off. And for example, when you're trying to take data and you don't know why you're not getting data and it turns out someone left a light on in the lab and so at 2 a.m. you have to go down and track a light and a beam because someone left the guide laser on and that takes about 45 minutes to figure out with an index card. You're like, where the hell is this beam coming from? It's very fun. That doesn't sound fun. Any other questions from the audience? Yeah. What was that? What's the last part? 
<laughs> um, I think what we had determined was the engineering. So we observe at night, obviously, because you can't really see the stars when the sun's up. Um, so we observe at night. Uh, so the, there's engineering teams that come on, come in during the day. There's this regular staff that go in. Um, our director, that's where she's stationed. Um, so there's a lot of people that do work during the day. Um, so I think what we had determined was someone from the engineering team was trying to, uh, I think they were working on Merc X or Mystic, and I think they ended up leaving, they left, one of the engineering team left the guide laser on and forgot to turn it off. Um, so they went down on the mountain, so they were there, um, they came up, but people come up and down the mountain quite frequently, but when we're there for observing runs, we don't leave the mountain, we're just up there the whole time. Um, but there's a lot of people that do go up and, excuse me, up and down. Um, but we, uh, we had some, not really, we, we just, we were very passive aggressive on our Discord channel. So we all communicate on a Discord channel and we're just like, who the hell left a light on? Like, why is this light on? And I think the person finally was like, sorry, didn't mean to do it. <laughs> or they just forgot. I mean, it happens, but it was just more kind of frustrating at 2 a.m. And you're like, <sighs> track and and then of course the person I was with also accidentally stepped in so they didn't ruin anything but are the the delay lines they're constantly active and so when you step in front of the delay line or in the delay line it freaks the carts out that move the mirrors and so the person I was with accidentally stepped in front of one of the delay lines so that also caused the whole issue and the whole facility was just like what the heck do we do? And so the carts were just moving back and forth trying to adjust because they lost all of its light and they're like, oh my God, what's going on? And so that that, that was a good night. <laughs> One hour of data after 10 days. You can see why it happens to a lot of astronomers. All right, so let's all give Ashley another round of applause for a great talk. And we'll move on to our trivia now. Um, before. While we're moving on to our trivia, if you haven't gotten enough science with us, there's also another presentation here at the Varsity uh, for the Science Cafe on May 30th titled How Sick Do You Feel by uh, Juan Martinez, where you can discover new ways to think about antibiotics. So it may not be space themed if that's your thing, but it's still science and still fun. So once we get those uh, trivia slides out, we're passing out cards now, and we'll be passing out our donation jars so you can vote for which uh, acronym do you think is better. Is it Chara or is it BOAT? I have my own opinion, but I'll hide it for now, and we'll see what you guys think. Good luck on the trivia.
Once you're done with those trivia cards, you can turn them in up at the uh, the merch table in the back with Fila. And then we'll get those grapes to you and find out who won our special trivia at the after the second talk.
All right. Hopefully you guys all did well on that trivia. I heard from a few of the PhDs in the audience that they might not necessarily have done that well. So you, you have a very good chance of winning here. All right, so I get to introduce our second speaker now, which is our latest and greatest hire at LSU. Uh, Dr. Eric Burns is our newest assistant professor at LSU. Uh, before coming here, he actually worked at NASA for six years. His research interests focus on understanding the most energetic explosions in the universe and involves building new space missions to study them. He has contributed to works that include uh, the precise measurement of the speed of gravity, not light, and, uh, dis and the discovery of, I can't read, and the discovery of explosions seen beyond our home, the Milky Way, for the first time. In his spare time, he hikes with the goal of visiting all the U.S. national parks. So there's a fun question to ask him if you don't have any interest in the science ones. Hopefully he'll draw your interest. Let's give a hand to Dr. Eric Burns. Okay, so I'm Eric Burns. Um, I've been at LSU for a while, but I joined in the pandemic, so most people think I'm new. Uh, my acronym is the boat, brightest of all time, and um, I'm hoping to win this contest against Ashley. Um, we're not very original people, so I'm also going to introduce the electromagnetic spectrum. <laughs> uh, so this is the universe in optical light, so visible light. Um, so this is what you see with your eye. Um, this picture is taken from Gaia. It's a very nice image. Um, Sag A star, the gigantic black hole, is in the center, and the Milky Way is along the plane here. Uh, you evolved to see this because it allows you to discriminate colors on Earth. It's a match of the wavelength output from the sun, the attenuation through the atmosphere, and the selection to see other animals. Um, on the bottom, I'm going to map out the spectrum, and we're going to lower energies now. So this is infrared. Again, you can see the Milky Way laid out across the center, but the details look quite a bit different because you're seeing a different wavelength of light. It's carrying different information. Um, this is most analogous to what we use for night vision and heat vision. Um, it's the light that your body gives off. You don't see it because you would blind yourself and it wouldn't be very useful. Going to lower energies, the universe begins to look quite a bit different. This is radio. You have along the center still the Milky Way along the plane, but you get this large extension in both directions and it's um, plasma, it's gas that's extending from the Milky Way above and below the plane. Um, and you can really see that this is a gigantic part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, it's most famous now for Wi-Fi. Um, it's you know historically radio, AM, FM, um, the things that you use to communicate with each other. Um, this is ultraviolet now, going to higher energies. You want me to get a drink? I don't know how to hold a drink and hold both of these, so it's going to be a long talk. Um, this sky map is a lot worse. And the reason is because this image was taken from a satellite in the 90s. We haven't had an upgrade since then. NASA's in the process of building it. Um, the regions that are too bright get kind of cut out from the image. But you can see that the Milky Way is still quite bright. Um, in the rest of the sky, um, there's these kind of holes for other bright sources. Uh, ultraviolet, as Ashley said, is you know what you use sunscreen to block. So you can view ultraviolet light. On the left, you can see kind of the effect of sunscreen. It's absorbing that light, protecting your skin. Uh, and and you know, that's why you wear it. Higher energies is x-rays. This is a new mission. It's a, a Russian-German mission that launched a couple of years ago. Um, it's a very, very nice all-sky image. You see the Milky Way. You see these blobs. These are the long-term remnants of supernova. Um, you also see above and below a bunch of point sources. These are other galaxies. Um, X-rays, of course, what we use to study bones. You know, you're seeing if something's fractured, looking through skeletons. These um, wavelengths of light have a lot of energy. They will go through skin and muscle and organs, but they won't go through bone, and it's how you can make these images. 
the highest energy form of light is gamma rays, and, and that's what I'm going to focus on today. Um, these are like a third of the electromagnetic spectrum. Again, the Milky Way is nice and bright, and these little dots around here are other galaxies. Um, so everything you see is this little tiny rainbow section in the center. Um, the electromagnetic spectrum is about a thousand times broader than what you can see yourself. And in modern astronomy, we try to see the same objects in as many wavelengths as we can to learn more about how they work. <laughs> uh, and again, we're on original, so the joke here is, is what drew Bruce Banner into the Incredible Hulk. So this is the full electromagnetic spectrum, and I will tell you how my field started, how gamma rays started. At the height of the Cold War, countries were detonating nukes, um, sometimes a thousand times a year, trying to make sure they worked, improve the nukes, terrify our enemies, uh, maybe send messages to people we didn't like very well, and eventually we realized that we were poisoning Earth. You could detect radioactive isotopes in the atmosphere, um, in water, we were polluting islands. It's not a good thing to do, especially because after the 4,000th test, we were pretty sure they worked. And to resolve that, the US, the United Kingdom, and the Soviet Union agreed to the Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. That was agreeing that we would only test nukes underground, so not in space, in the atmosphere, or underwater. And now this is the modern version. Um, if you want to do citizen science, the best compilation of this is from a random Wikipedia user, not some government agency. Uh, but most of Earth has signed it. You'll notice that some countries have not. So China has not, France has not, Israel has not, which I will come back to. Uh, but by and large, people have obeyed the nuclear test ban treaty. It's now more than 60 years old. But it's the Cold War, we don't trust the Soviets. So we needed to make sure that when they agreed they wouldn't be testing atmospheric nukes, that they were telling the truth. And the solution to this was to launch satellites. Uh, in this case, they're called the Vela satellites. They were launched to look for this signature. When a nuke goes off in the atmosphere, you get a millisecond long burst of gamma rays. It returns to nothing. And then you get a few second long pulse, um, basically related to burning of the atmosphere. So this is the signature. This time is in seconds. This is the count rate. So very bright, nothing, bright again, and then a nice decay. To monitor for these in gamma rays, we launched the Vela satellites. Uh, so this is from Los Alamos. This is a person for scale. There's these little cylinders that sit there. And these cylinders are crystals that you grow in a lab uh, when a gamma ray hits them, they produce blue light that we can then read out with normal electronics. And um, this is what I work with in most of my research. I still don't actually know how they work. I think they're mostly magic. Uh, but the technology is 60 years old, uh, and I'm quite glad it works. So we launched these satellites very far from Earth, one on each side. Together they can absorb, they can observe all of Earth, make sure there's no detonations that occur. Um, so this is the signature that you expect to see. And on June 2nd, 1967, oh, I forgot. Uh, there actually was a nuke that went off in the atmosphere um, after the Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. It was south of South Africa in the Indian Ocean. Um, officially, nobody will say who did it. It was Israel. They were doing it to threaten their neighbors in the Middle East. Um, but it was the Vela satellites that detected it. Um, and it's referred to as the Vela incident, if you'd like to look that up later. So on June 2nd, 1967, the Vela satellites, which had been launched, this specific pair just a few months earlier, detected a burst with a sharp spike and a few second long decay. So if you look at the comparison of these two light curves, they look reasonably similar. Uh, so my assumption is when this first went off, they assumed a nuke had gone off. Uh, but with, the, with multiple Vela satellites, you can determine where these events came from. And it did not come from Earth. And they realized that pretty quickly. They didn't know what they were. Uh, so basically, they realized they had discovered something, but it wasn't 
that much of a priority because it was in the middle of the Cold War. Uh, but in 1973, uh, they published a paper announcing the discovery of astrophysical gamma ray bursts. So these are flashes of gamma rays from the universe. You have a background count rate, a very bright spike in this case, and it's like you're turning a flashlight on and off. You can see these bright things for an instant, maybe a second long, maybe 100 seconds long. Uh, and we announced these on June 1st, 1973. So the 50th anniversary is actually next week. Uh, NASA is preparing a kind of big press release to you know, celebrate this achievement. Um, they, I'm sure they will explain things much better than I am at the moment. So if you find my talk interesting, I would encourage you to keep an eye out for that. Um, so gamma ray bursts are the most luminous events in the universe since the Big Bang. Uh, the most energetic explosions. Um, one of them you could have seen from seven billion light years away with your own eye and optical light if you were looking at the right spot at the right time. Uh, this is half the universe away. It holds the record for the most distant object you could see with your eye uh, by a factor of like 10,000. Um, they're really fascinating sources to study. Um, what occurs is you have a central engine Generally, that's just a black hole. It's going to power jets, so collimated outflows in two different directions opposite each other. Those jets move outwards at basically the speed of light. Uh, they, if you took Earth and you shot it at 99.999% the speed of light, that's basically what's occurring. Uh, there, we don't really, we've seen at this point 10,000 of them and we still don't really know how they work. Uh, but I will talk about two of them, uh, and then the question that we always get asked when uh, we talk about gamma ray bursts. So the first thing is, there's actually two types. Um, they're called short and long because some of them are short and some of them are long. And we're, again, we're not clever with how we name things. On the right, you can see a set of light curves for different events. On the bottom is time scale, so this one is you know, half a second long, that's a short gamma ray burst. It's less than two seconds. This is a short one, this is a short one, and these three are long. And um, if you can tell the difference between short and long, that's about half of my job, so you could probably do it. Uh, and we have realized that these have different origins. They look the same to us in gamma rays, but the underlying event that powers them is actually different. So short gamma ray bursts, um, I have to explain what a neutron star is. So if you take this scale picture of Earth, Jupiter, and the Sun, um, the distance between them is not the scale, but the Sun is you know, several thousand times larger than Earth. The Sun is the most massive thing around by an enormous margin. On the right is a map of Baton Rouge. You can map out about 14 miles, uh, basically encompassing most of the city. And if you take the mass of the sun, you compress it into that distance, then you get a neutron star. So the mass of the sun in, in Baton Rouge, it is the densest matter in existence. If you add much additional mass to this, it's going to just collapse into a black hole. Uh, these objects are very interesting to study for a lot of reasons. They were discovered also in the 60s. Uh, but I am going to talk about the case where you have two neutron stars. And, uh, largely by coincidence, the distance from here to LIGO Livingston is two neutron stars. Um, LIGO Livingston is, of course, in Livingston. Uh, this is an image taken of LIGO, which is actually explained as an interferometer. It is the most precise ruler ever measured. If it measured the distance from here to the sun, it could tell you that to the width of a human hair. Uh, it's the most sensitive thing ever built. And being Louisiana, they have just started logging around it and destroyed how sensitive the interferometers are. So that's a, a nice fun fact. Um, there are five interferometers in existence. There are two LIGO interferometers in the United States. Virgo is in Italy, Kagura in Japan. And there's a fifth LIGO interferometer, which will be, um, it's been built, but will be assembled in India. Um, the best one of these is LIGO Livingston. We have the most sensitive one. That's what's shown in this image. There are two arms, that's one of the arms, it's four kilometers long. 
Um, it's operated by Joe, who's sitting over here. Um, so we're better than everyone else, and I think it's largely thanks to him. Um, so I think we should do a nice round of applause for Joe. <laughs> so <laughs> LIGO, I think, is um, really incredible. And I'm going to show an image built from NASA. Um, the objects that are shown are two neutron stars at the beginning. So two neutron stars, they're orbiting each other. This blue light is gravitational waves. It's the signature that LIGO can detect. As they orbit, they move towards each other. They go faster and faster until they merge and explode. You power these ultra-relativistic jets. A bunch of things are going to happen, which I'll explain in a second, and I'm going to take another drink. Now NASA has to tell you how they built this, because they're not famous enough already. Um, OK, so this is the signatures that you can get from the merging of two neutron stars. So you start with two objects that are the densest things in existence. When they merge, they're generally going to form a black hole. As they're merging, they're producing these gravitational wave signals. They're powering these jets out at basically the speed of light. And those jets are going to release the gamma ray burst signature that I mentioned. And um, it's, NASA decided that pink represents gamma rays, so that's what you have at the end here. In the center is kind of a donut. Um, that donut is called a kilonova. If you take these neutron stars, you spin them around each other at 30% the speed of light, it's fast enough that you can actually rip matter off the neutron stars. When that matter starts to come free, the crushing gravity of the neutron stars is no longer acting on it, and you have what's basically nuclear popcorn. The material is going to explode out. It's going to form the heaviest element. So if you have gold or platinum or silver or uranium or anything that's that heavy, um, it basically comes from neutron star mergers. We were reasonably sure about this for quite a while at this point, uh, but on August 17th, 2017, a neutron star merger that occurred 140 million years ago um, had its signal arrive at Earth. And this is what we saw. What you hear is what LIGO is actually observing, matched out in time and frequency. And two seconds later, the gamma ray burst. So uh, this is the first time we saw the same event in light and gravity. Um, it's, I think, one of my favorite results in astrophysics. It confirmed a lot of things that we already knew, uh, but it's nice to actually make the measurement. So for example, this is how we measured the speed of gravity. Um, that result does things like explain why you experience time. Um, it took two $1 billion machines to make the measurement, but you can just kind of see the result uh, that they arrived together. Uh, and this was, again, you know, proof of where gold and everything else comes from. So that is one type, that's short gamma ray bursts. Uh, the boat, the acronym comes from a long gamma ray burst. Again, they last more than two seconds. We're not very clever. And these come from the death of massive stars. Um, so you have a nebula, this star is in the center. It's at the end of its life where its core collapses to a black hole. That black hole is eating it from the inside out, again, powering these jets that fly out at the speed of light in opposing directions. Um, in the end, this will also power a supernova, a rare type of supernova. Um, and these are more energetic than short gamma ray bursts. This video is very long. Um, this is what's occurring. So you have your black hole eating the star, powering these jets, and you have these shells that are going to collide and give you your magenta gamma rays. And that's the signature that we're recovering with the Vela-like satellites, the gamma ray burst monitors. Uh, hang on. OK, there we go. So long gamma ray bursts last more than a few seconds. This is time. This is, again, count rate. 
showing brightness over a background from the universe. Um, this is a representative set of long gamma ray bursts that we have seen with NASA's Fermi Space Telescope. It's um, also by coincidence, it is 15 years old next week. Um, so this is after 15 years of observing. Each one of these is about 10 times brighter than the previous one. Um, each one is scientifically very interesting for us to understand. Gamma ray bursts, there's probably 100 papers written on each of these. Uh, you can see that they just get brighter and brighter. This was a previous record holder, and on October last year, this is what we saw. Um, we immediately knew it was the brightest one we had ever seen, so we got the moniker of the boat. Um, I think it's a better acronym because it made it to CNN, and I think that's really the baseline we should be using here. Um, but if you'll notice, at about 500,000 counts per second, it cuts off. And if you've ever tried to look at the sun, you will just reflexively close your eyes. It's too bright to look at. Um, or TV recordings can get saturated, and you, and you can see kind of artifacts in the recording. The same thing happened here. The event was so bright that the best instrumentation available was blinded. Uh, and we figured this out. And a graduate student did an enormous amount of work and reconstructed the actual intrinsic brightness, which gave you this. Uh, it is not only the brightest thing ever seen, um, that was the previous record holder in 55 years of observing. Uh, so it's just really out of class with anything ever seen. Um, it arrived at Earth uh, and it was so bright, we actually didn't realize it was a gamma ray burst for a few hours. It was so bright, we confused ourselves. The first signature was actually detected by Voyager 1, which is in interstellar space, um, on the day before, on October 21st. It went through the solar system, arriving at distant spacecraft Gaia and Integral. It then passed by Earth, being detected by Fermi, and it was so bright, it affected the ionosphere of Earth. You could see its effect on our own atmosphere. It kept going, the last, uh, passed again, then the wind of the A satellite, and the last signature being um, detected by satellites around Mars. So this initial explosion was detected by 33 satellites. Um, that is the record by about 30 satellites. Um, it was detected by more than 100 telescopes on Earth. Um, I didn't realize this was being recorded, so I pulled these screen grabs. This is um, footage from a new an animation that NASA is revealing next week. Um, so if you, you know, post this, don't attribute it to me. What happened, so you still have this nice nebula. You have the center star. Um, you have the jets that propagate out. And you can see this very, very narrow core that we've now added to the animation. And this is kind of swept in front. Um, I couldn't figure out how to download this, so I apologize for that. But uh, you can see this beam is, is you know, very narrow, very focused. And what occurred was this was perfectly aligned with Earth, apparently for the first time, at least for a nearby event. OK, so this is, uh, went twice. Um, this is the most kind of technical plot I have. Um, the x-axis is brightness. The y-axis is number of gamma ray bursts. Uh, if you are very scientific minded, this is a log scale. So each of these is 10 times brighter than the last. In blue is the distribution of gamma ray bursts we've seen in 55 years of observing. And, and we can calculate from this distribution roughly how often we expect a given brightness to occur. So once per year, there are about, adding these up, 50 of those, which is what we expect after 50 years. You can calculate that for once per decade, once per century. There's you know, one event at 50 years, which is roughly what we have been observing. You can continue on to, if this will advance. Colin's working on it. Well, I got to get a drink now. Oh, OK. So once per millennium, and finally, once per 10,000 years. 
So the boat, the brightest of all time, it's not actually the brightest of all time in the history of the universe, uh, but it is the brightest one seen since human civilization began. Uh, I've been working in this field for 10 years, so there's basically a, a one in a thousand chance that I would get to see this thing. And I was spent several weeks making sure I hadn't fucked this calculation up because uh, that seemed wrong, but uh, we're pretty sure this is correct. If we see a second one, then I'm wrong, but that would be nice. We get to study another one of these. Uh, and we announced this in, in March. So uh, I don't know, a thousand scientists worked on this. We all kind of released our results at the same time. Um, and I think that worked pretty well. And because you know my life is pretty awesome, this conference was in Hawaii. So um, work paid for it, got to hang out, take a nice vacation. Um, and in Hawaii, by chance, I, I took both of these pictures. And uh, on the left is the sun, on the right is the moon. And you can see this nice halo, which somebody tells me that distance is 22 degrees for reasons I don't really understand. But when you have a bright source and you have scattering, so what's occurring is around this region you have, um, in Hawaii, humidity in the atmosphere that is acting like a mirror. So it's bending that light, some fraction of that light back towards you. And when that light gets bent back at the same angle, around the source, you end up getting this ring image. And you can also get that with the moon. And I think that was a full moon. So something that people more clever than me uh, anticipated, but I did not, in the center is the boat itself. This is the aftermath of the initial explosion in x-rays. Around it are concentric rings that you can see. Uh, in all, there are actually 22 of them, and they will appear, you can see, expand in time. Um, we don't get to take pretty pictures. We do high energy things, and it turns out it's really hard to image high energy photons. We don't get to make pretty pictures. So this is like the prettiest picture we've ever delivered. Uh, but I think it's a, a pretty incredible thing to see. What happens is this, you have the source. These are representing dust, so two different clouds of dust, and the source is gonna to propagate to Earth. But you'll see the detonation. As it arrives at these dust clouds, you'll get a ring. The dust clouds are acting like a mirror. They're reflecting that light back. Each dust cloud will reflect at a different time, and as it arrives at Earth, you get concentric rings around it. In this case, the reason we have this dust is because the boat happened to be aligned with the plane of the Milky Way itself. So you, have, you can see these rings. Each of these rings arises from um, following this line. The darker spots is a different dust cloud. And you can see that this aligns with the arms of the Milky Way going all the way out. And on top, you see how much it's inclined above the Milky Way. So it, it was four degrees, but you can map out again the uh, dark regions being the regions of dust clouds. It turns out there's dust in this region, 5,000 light years above the edge of the Milky Way, and nobody knew this existed. Uh, the boat itself is a once in 10,000 year event. If you want it to, arrive along some path in the Milky Way itself, it's about a 10% chance. So the chance of this occurring is something like once in 100,000 years. Um, I'm still trying to figure out how I screwed that calculation up because it doesn't seem realistic that that is actually the number. Uh, but so far it seems to be that one in 1,000 year kind of chance event allowed us to learn something new about our own home galaxy, which would have been impossible to learn otherwise. And it's not just about our own galaxy, it tells us something about how all of the other galaxies work as well. Okay, uh, the question we always get when people talk about gamma ray bursts is, is it going to kill everybody? If you like science and you go on YouTube, which is where I pulled this image from, this is the answer you're gonna get. Um, the real answer is probably not. Um, 
there has probably not been a long game of Reapers in the Milky Way itself uh, in about a billion years. You need that to occur. If it's in the Milky Way, it can end all life on Earth. It could vaporize the atmosphere and we're done. Um, and there's nothing anybody could do about it. A short gamma ray burst is less energetic. Uh, if a short gamma ray burst hits Earth, it's going to uh, vaporize the ozone layer. And that means that the protection we get from ultraviolet radiation from the sun will be gone. Um, you won't be allowed to go outside or you're going to get cancer. Um, you won't really be able to grow most crops because they're just going to die. And that's going to be really bad for everybody. Um, the bad news is it looks like this actually did happen to Earth 450 million years ago. There are five mass extinctions in history. The first one was the Ordovician extinction. Half of all life died. 85% of species ended. Um, and people argue this came from a short gamma ray burst. The good news is they don't happen in the Milky Way very often. If they do happen, they also have to be pointed right at us. And that's the thing that's basically saving us. Um, so we're all going to be fine. There's no gamma ray burst pointing at us at the moment. That's something that I think we can all be pretty happy about. Um, the downside is global warming is also destroying the ozone layer. So, you know, that sucks. Uh, buy EVs and, and do all those things. So I, I think that's my last slide which is a good one to end on. So thank you for your time, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you for that happy talk. And thanks for that sneak preview into a NASA. You don't have clearance, do you? I say no. That's for the best. It'll be fine. Do we have any questions from the audience as our YouTube delay catches up? Yes. So that, okay, the question is, for the brightness of this event, how much of it was from the intrinsic brightness of the event or the optimal viewing angle? Um, it's a really good question. We don't really know the answer. Um, we're sure this is basically the best viewing angle we're ever going to get. Um, the other aspect that comes into the brightness at Earth is how far away it was. So if it's very far, it just appears much fainter despite being intrinsically bright. Um, as it turns out, this is also intrinsically the most energetic gamma ray burst ever seen by a sample of approximately 1,000. Um, and it is also the closest bright gamma ray burst ever seen. And I don't think there's really an explanation for that other than we, or at least I got ridiculously lucky to see something like this. And um, I don't know, it's a, it's a, basically you hit at the key questions in our field that we're trying to answer. Um, we're trying to get something like 30 different groups to put all of their data together to answer that specific question, uh, but people don't really like to get along all that much, so it's a, it's a fun effort that we're, we're trying to work through. Uh, my favorite Pokemon is Dragonite, and that is the correct answer. Uh, the question is, it affected the ionosphere, so how did it do that? Um, I have no idea. The, <laughs> the effect was um, you can measure, it's VLF, very long, very low frequency, I guess, so very low frequency radio waves. Um, the ionosphere is like the charged region of the atmosphere, um, it looks like the pause did so much energy that it kind of shifted the shape of it um, and caused kind of shock waves that traveled through it around Earth. I don't actually understand how that occurred. It's been on my reading list for several months, and I've not gotten around to it. Um, 
The other thing that people are trying to figure out now is if it affected the ionosphere of Mars. Um, it, it, one of the 33 spacecraft was called MAVEN. It orbits Mars. It, it kind of studies these things. It looks like this might be a unique opportunity to make that measurement, to kind of understand something about Mars we don't already know. Um, but the analysis is really difficult, so they need a few months really to work that out still. Uh, what's my favorite national park and why? Uh, that is a really good question. Uh, the favorite one I've been to, um, I'll probably have to say Zion, because there's a hike there where they drop you off at the top of this ravine, and you hike down and you follow a river where the river is on both sides has like 2,000-foot canyons. And the hike down, like three-quarters of the time, you are in the river itself. And you spend the whole day hiking out, um, and they'll pick you up with a shuttle and take you home. Um, and it's one of the more interesting experiences of my life. Uh, but I've only been to half the park so far. So I, my bet is Dry Tortugas out in Florida, which is like an old star fort um, in the Caribbean. Sounds awesome. And um, also, I think the Alaskan parks where you can walk around and not see anybody sound quite tempting. Yeah, a lot of bears. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, hopefully no bears for me, but uh, I guess we'll see. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's a very good question. So how did I come up with the acronym BOAT? I did not come up with that acronym. Um, I get credit for coming up with this because I organized the community to do press. Um, the acronym the BOAT came out of a colleague of mine named Wen Fei Fong, who made a joke in her Slack. It's like Discord. It's like a chat service with her group. Uh, her graduate student then got interviewed on CNN and used the name. And at that point, everyone loved it, and it stuck. Um, I don't know how she came up with it, but I think she's much better at it than the rest of us are. Uh, yeah, the question is, how do people come up with acronym names? Uh, there's a phrase for this called a backronym, where you come up with the answer that you want, and then you think about it as cleverly as you can to make the acronym work out. Um, NASA has two gamma ray burst detecting satellites, Fermi and SWIFT. On SWIFT, the gamma ray mission is called the Burst Alert Telescope, so SWIFT-BAT. Uh, a colleague of mine works on that instrument a lot. He has an acronym for Swift Bat Guano, uh, where it is dumping data from the satellite, Guano being batshit. So um, he, he, he's built an entire ecosystem of bat-related backronyms. Uh, and he's published, like, I think six of these at this point. And it's official NASA terminology. They let him get away with this. And I don't know how they do it. But um, yeah, you can totally do that, and I think you should absolutely work on that as something in your career. <laughs> that is a great question. So the question is... Um, you know, with this dust cloud, have we been able to detect it again? Uh, and the answer is, I think so. Um, so if you watch this GIF, you can see the center, you can see the rings expanding, and you can see the time that it takes for the rings to span, which is linear in time. So as time goes on, you can take one of the, Let's pick this one. So this is going to be a very bright ring. It's going to keep going out. You can project where it's going to be. And somebody has an observation with Chandra, which is the most sensitive X-ray telescope in existence, and they point it out here. And they pointed it there like two months after the event had occurred. And the idea is that the ring should be there at that time, assuming that the dust cloud has the full extent there. Um, so the observation was made, and they have not reported it yet. It's a colleague of mine. Uh, but I think he recovered it. And it should allow us to answer things like, how big is the cloud? 
um, how much dust is actually there, what is the actual composition of the cloud. It looks like it's silicates, uh, you know, silicate molecules and, and built up into dust, uh, but also kind of the size of the dust grains themselves. So um, I should add this event will be able to detect this centerpiece for probably 10 years. Uh, so observations are still ongoing. We just found the supernova about a month ago. Um, so I think this is kind of an ongoing study that, that will you know, continue to learn things for a long time. All right, and with that, let's give another round of applause to Eric Burns. <laughs> Don't ask him to reveal any secrets. All right, so we'll move on to the solutions for our trivia. Uh, in the meantime, Ashley, we did actually get another question from YouTube, and it's, do you agree that Chara is the most powerful telescope of all time? It seems like a pointed question. Sorry, YouTube. She gave the award to uh, James Webb. Yep. All right. So here we go. You guys got all of these, right? Of course. <laughs> Olympus Mons is the tallest known mountain on a planet. What is the height? 13.6 miles. It's huge. Green Dunes is a rare type of aurora. There's six little bands there. Uh, in this moment, Venus is the closest planet to Earth, but what was the closest planet at noon today? It was Mercury. It moved pretty quick. Uh, what colors are the sunset on Mars? Blue, and this is interesting, because the sky is blue here during the day but the sky is red on Mars during the night, and our sunsets are red and orange. So it's kind of a flip, right? It's a lot of atmospheric craziness. Uh, Pluto was first discovered in 1930. That is 90 years ago, by the way, heads up. That's not 70 years ago, as a lot of us fast math do. Uh, what fraction of the orbit has it completed since then? It's only 3 eighths. It, it's chugging along. Kepler's third law is not doing it any favors. How many exoplanets are confirmed? 5,000, that's hard to read, 419. Jupiter has a large magnetosphere. Compared, it is comparable to the sun. What is the furthest human object made? Uh, that would be Voyager 1. Uh, the central peak of, oh my gosh, on the asteroid Vesta has an equal height to Olympus Mons, callback. And what is the average temperature on Uranus? It is minus 224 degrees Celsius. So our winner for the trivia with a score of 6 out of 10, it was hard, Scott C. You still here? Very nice job. All right, get those raffle tickets out. All right, looking at the last four digits of your card, it is five one nine six. Five, one, nine, six. Hey, we got a winner. All right, so winner of the uh, trivia and the raffle, go up to the merch table to claim your prize. And with that, we bid you all a very good night. Thank you all for coming. Before we all go, let's give a round of applause, applause for Brad. This is his last time ever at AOT. He is moving on to the adult world. 
So let's give him a round of applause for all of his hard work. Where are you going again, Brad? New Mexico. I'll be in New Mexico uh, doing, yes, I'm technically a doctor. That was a bad choice, right? All right. Thanks, guys. Have a good night. See you guys in June.